I've been on the floor a number of times this week talking about the importance of trade, talking about the need for us to expand more exports around the world. The United States has not been in a position for seven years to do that, and that's why Trade Promotion Authority is incredibly important to our workers, our farmers, the people we represent. By doing so, we give people a shot at actually increasing their salaries, their families' income, because trade jobs tend to pay better, have better benefits. In my home state of Ohio, 60 percent of our soybean crop is exported. We want to be sure those farmers have access to more markets. 25 percent of our manufacturing jobs, factory jobs, are now trade jobs. So these exports are really important. Unfortunately, what's happened over the last seven years is as we try to sell our products, our services, to the 95 percent of the world outside of our borders, it's getting harder because other countries are concluding trade agreements with each other. So during this time when the U.S. has basically been sitting on the sidelines, other countries have negotiated trade opening agreements. This means lowering tariffs and non-tariff barriers, actually taking market share away from us that we would otherwise have. So this is an important issue. If you're for jobs, you should be for exports. You should be for the United States government helping our workers, helping us to be able to knock down these barriers. Other countries tend to have higher tariffs. They tend to have higher non-tariff barriers. So this is part of what we ought to be about here in this body. And I'm glad we're finally taking this up. The administration now supports this. That's good. However, as we do that, we also have to be darn sure that the playing field is more level. What do I mean by that? Well, we know, again, that other countries have higher tariffs than we do on average. But they also do other things that make it harder for our workers, our farmers, to compete. Uh, one is they subsidize their products. We know this because we have taken a number of these countries to court, meaning the World Trade Organization, about this very topic. And here in the United States, we have the ability. If a company is selling into our market with a subsidized product, we have the ability to seek relief for that. And we should. It's not fair. Second, uh, some countries just want to dump their product here in the United States at below their costs. Why? It's kind of like what they say in business, a loss leader. They'll take a loss on it, but they'll get market share and knock out a U.S. competitor. That takes jobs away from us. That's also not fair. And again, there are international tribunals that deal with this, but also we have our own laws here in this country that say, if you're dumping your product here in the United States, that's considered unfair. And a company can bring a case, and if they can prove that they are materially injured, the company is materially injured, they can then find some relief there. So as we are expanding opportunities for trade all around the world, which is a good thing, we also have to be sure that our laws work to protect our workers who are not getting a fair shake. And by the way, a lot of these workers are doing everything right, everything that's being asked of them. They are going through worker retraining to learn how to operate the most highly technical, sophisticated machines that are the most efficient. Frankly, that often results in fewer jobs but it res results also in very high quality U.S. products that are being made with the best technology. Some of these workers have been asked to make concessions in their pay or their benefits in order to be competitive. And what they say to me is, Rob, you know, we know we're in a global marketplace. We know we're going to have to compete. We know it's not just about competing with Indiana anymore. It's about competing with India and China and Japan and Brazil and the European Union. And so we're willing to become more competitive to learn these skills, to play by these global rules. But once we do that, we want that playing field to be level. And that's fair. That's the least that they should expect from us here in the United States Congress to ensure that while they are making these changes to be more competitive, that we are watching their back. And that's what a lot of the debate has been about with regard to this trade promotion authority vote that we're having. This is the opportunity for Congress to express its will as to what these trade negotiations ought to look like. It's not about a specific negotiation, Trans-Pacific Partnership, or the TTIP negotiations with the EU, or other bilateral relationships. It is about establishing what Congress believes ought to be the right rules going forward. I am very hopeful, Mr. President, that today on the floor, we'll have the opportunity to vote on a couple of different amendments that relate to this. A one, that the presiding officer is very well aware of, is a strong interest of mine, is ensuring that other countries don't manipulate their currency so that their exports are less expensive to us and our imports that we send to them are more expensive. That's not fair. 
When they intervene deliberately in their currency for that purpose and do it in a large-scale, protracted way, that's called currency manipulation. There are rules against it. The International Monetary Fund has rules against it. As an example, every one of the partners in the trade agreement that is being negotiated now with the Pacific countries, every one of those countries, the Trans-Pacific Partnership countries, has signed up to these obligations already. So the amendment we'll be voting on today simply says, here's the, st the standard that you've already agreed to. Let's say that when you're negotiating a trade agreement with us to lower barriers, barriers, both here in the United States, to give them more access to our market and to give us more access to their market, which, as I said earlier, is something we've got to be doing to help our farmers and our workers, let's be sure that those benefits can't be undone by then going in and manipulating their currency, which is a market distortion. Most countries would say, we agree with that. And we're not doing it currently, and that's true. I don't think any of the 12 countries we're talking about here are currently doing it. I will say they have in the past. Since 2012, I don't believe Japan has been doing it, and don't take my word for it. Listen to the International Monetary Fund and the Department of Treasury. They give us a report every year on this. But before that, they did, over 300 times. And it makes it a whole lot harder for us to compete. Again, our workers, our farmers are willing to be the most productive, the most efficient. They know they've got to compete. We should applaud them for that. And we should support them and help them. But they want to be sure that after they've done all that, and after we've reduced some of these barriers, that the playing field doesn't tilt, making it easier for these other countries to send their product here, which outcompete ours because of currency manipulation. That's what that issue is all about. There'll be two amendments, one of which will be offered by Senator Hatch and one offered by me and Senator Stabenow. And the one that we're offering is one that does have teeth in it. In other words, it says this needs to be an enforceable provision. But it leaves the discretion within the office of the trade representative, the U.S. trade representative, to determine how that's done. It's an office that I had the honor of holding. At one time, I had the great honor of representing our country all around the world and negotiating agreements and talking about these very issues with other countries. And I can tell you sometimes other countries may not want to talk about it. But at the end of the day, they know that currency manipulation is bad for everybody. It's bad for the international trading system. It's tempting to do because short term, it makes your exports less expensive. And if you want to be an export driven economy, as China is, well, that helps sometimes. But it's not ultimately in anybody's best interest. So let's have these disciplines, but then let's make them enforceable so that there is some ability for us to truly stop this manipulation, to discourage it, to have disciplines in place. That's what that amendment's going to be about. By the way, I know the administration has said they don't support this. It's interesting uh, because here's Secretary Liu's letter this week to Congress, holding our trade partners accountable for their currency practices has always been important to this administration. Well, let's do hold them accountable. I agree with him. I agree with this letter. I don't agree with his recommended veto threat to the president should you actually put accountable language into the Trade Promotion Authority. So I hope he'll stick with this letter and not his recommendation to the president. The president himself has talked about this. He's talked about his opposition to currency manipulation. And by the way, so have 60 United States senators. This was in 2013. They're not all currently serving the United States Senate, but 60 senators actually signed a letter saying, in our trade agreements, we must have enforceable, accountable, enforceable currency manipulation provisions. So most of this body has been on record in the past. This is what the president said back in 2007. It wasn't this week, but it was 2007. He said he'll work with his colleagues in the Senate to ensure any trade agreement brought before this Congress is measured not against administration commitments, not just a commitment will do this, but instead against the rights of Americans to protection from unfair trade practices, including currency manipulation. So the notion that the president might veto this because it has protections against currency manipulation, I don't think so. I think he understands the importance of trade promotion authority. I certainly do. I think he knows that we need to get off the sidelines and get back in the business of negotiating agreements that make sense for our farmers, our workers, our service providers. But I think in his heart, <laughs> he also realizes you've got to have this discipline in place. The alternative, by the way, would be interesting. You could end up with lowering tariffs and non-tariff barriers in this agreement, and then one of these countries that has previously been involved in currency manipulation, like Malaysia or like Japan, could step in and do it again and undo so many of the benefits 
That would be pretty tough to explain to our constituents. We had the opportunity to address this and chose not to. Some are concerned about this being a poison pill. I would just say the obvious, which is if you have more protections in here, it won't be harder to pass this in the House of Representatives because the concern, obviously, a lot of people have is that trade is somehow not fair. Uh, I agree that we ought to pass trade promotion authority. It's incredibly important to the people I represent. It's incredibly important to our country. It's even a geopolitical issue now because America's footprint in that region of the world, the Asian Pacific, should be greater. We're competing with China in so many respects, and one is with regard to commerce, and China is one of these countries that is negotiating agreements pretty rapidly with countries all throughout the region. It's important we get back in the business of establishing those trade ties. And that's a geopolitical issue. I would even say it's a national security issue and a strategic issue. But it's also just important to our economy. We all want to give this economy a shot in the arm. This weak recovery we're working through right now is weaker because we are not seeing the gains in exports we would otherwise see if we were opening up these markets. By the way, we only have free trade agreements with 10% of the global GDP. You think about it, we don't have an agreement with the EU or with China or with Japan or many other large economies, Brazil. But about 10% of the world, we do have trade agreements with them. And we send 47% of our exports to that 10% of the world. From Ohio, by, by the way, it's more than half, about 52% of our exports. But again, as we do that, <laughs> let's be darn sure that we are leveling that playing field, that we are addressing these issues we all know exist, whether it's dumping product here or whether it's illegally subsidizing product or whether it is manipulating currency. It seems to me this is the right balance. It seems to me this is something that, again, Congress owes the people I represent. Watch their back. Make sure they get a fair shake. The other amendment that I hope we'll have the opportunity to vote on this afternoon is being discussed right now in another room off this chamber is an amendment that ensures that you have a more level playing field with regard to being able to bring these cases against companies that sell their product into the United States unfairly because they sell them at below cost, they dump them, or they subsidize them. And there are governments that do a lot of subsidization. Again, that's another market distortion. We should fight against it. The rules that are currently in place have been there a long time. They're consistent with the World Trade Organization. Other countries have these rules in place as well. But I will tell you, the way in which companies seek relief and get relief right now is far from perfect. Because so often, by the time a company can show that they're materially injured, which is the standard, it's too late. The market share is gone. Many of the workers are gone. Sometimes the companies themselves are gone. This legislation is going to be introduced by Senator Brown, my colleague from Ohio, and myself. Senator Brown's been talking about this issue on the floor. Uh, he's passionate about it. When we travel around the state, both of us to places like Cleveland and Toledo and Youngstown and Dayton, we hear about this issue. Uh, we hear that, yeah, we can operate on a level playing field, but please help us to ensure that we, when we find product that's subsidized, when we find product that's being dumped here, that we have the chance to be able to get the relief that we deserve. So this amendment enhances those protections for Ohio workers seeking relief from these illegally undersold or subsidized imports. By the way, the amendment is now backed by over 80 trade associations and companies, including some great companies in Ohio, Nucor, ArcelorMittal, U.S. Steel, Timken, and others. It's a common sense bipartisan measure that basically says workers shouldn't have to lose their jobs before their company can get relief from these illegal actions. 78 out of 100 of my colleagues here on the floor of the Senate recently backed a customs bill. It included this language. So there's a lot of support for this here on this floor. We would love to get this included in this legislation because this is the legislation that's most likely to move through the House and to the President. This is the legislation where it ought to be given that, again, we're talking about how to exp expand exports. That's good, but also ensure that we have more fairness in terms of the international trade situation. Last night on the floor, I was talking about AK Steel based in Westchester, Ohio. They've got 4,000 workers in the state of Ohio. I talked about their production facility in Zanesville, Ohio, 250 workers are there, UAW workers. They make grain-oriented electrical steel. It's a specialty steel. It's exported all over the world. And I went through what happened to them. They were exporting it to China. China illegally shut out this kind of specialty steel. 
and they lost 92% of their exports to China. Even though it was illegal for China to do it, even though we won, the United States government took China to the World Trade Organization and won, China then appealed that. China used all the time they could possibly use to avoid complying with that order. By the time it was over, it was five or six years, they lost 92% of their exports. So they lost hundreds of jobs in Ohio because they couldn't get into that Chinese market. By the way, it's now happening in the European Union for other purposes, apparently because of concern about other products, the European Union is now also blocking some of this very specialty steel made in my home state of Ohio. So it happens overseas, we know that, and yet when this same company goes to our Commerce Department, our International Trade Commission, to seek relief for illegally traded imports coming in, these are imports that are illegally traded, they have a hard time getting relief in time for it to be helpful to them to be able to get on their feet. So American products are shut out of China and the EU, but American workers can't get the help they deserve in a timely manner to keep illegally traded imports from flooding our market. This provision would help change that, this amendment we've been talking about. This is called the Level the Playing Field Amendment. It helps protect thousands of American jobs that would otherwise be put at risk because our trade laws, frankly, just haven't kept up with the speed of international commerce. I had some Ohio steel pipe and tube manufacturing companies in my office yesterday. As some of you know, Ohio is a leader in this part of the steel industry, which is a growth industry for the most part because you have a lot more oil and gas wells, natural gas wells cropping up around the country. Uh, these companies employ thousands of workers now across my state. Frankly, they're having a tough time right now because of the market. Nothing to do with imports, but the fact that the price of oil is such that it's harder to justify drilling new wells, and so the fracking has slowed down, and so they've lost some business. But the other thing that's happened is there has been a surge of foreign imports. So there is a record number now of imports of pipe and tube products coming into this country at a time when our companies are already seeing kind of a soft market because of the lower price of oil and less activity in the oil fields and gas, natural gas fields in Ohio and around the country. So there are companies like Timken Steel, which has over 1,000 workers in Canton, Ohio, who are continuing to make investments in their plant so that it can be updated, it can be modern, again, be the most efficient plant in the world. They just made a $300 million investment. And indeed, I was there recently. I was able to visit with them and see some of their new investment, and it will be one of the most modern steel plants in the world. Their export products are really impressive. They send them all over the world. These are engineered steel products. But just yesterday, they told me they're now approaching about a 50% capacity. That's just barely breaking even for them. Uh, and by the way, they're at a higher capacity level than most in the industry these days. And again, it's a combination of a soft market, but also a record number of imports of pipe and tube products. A little further east in the Mahoning Valley, Valorec in Youngstown also produces pipe and tube products. Some of you have followed Valorec because it's been in the news some. It's kind of a poster child for what American manufacturers are, should be doing, which is investing in plant and equipment. First new steel mill, by the way, in the Mahoning Valley in probably a couple generations. It's really exciting. But boy, they're having a tough time right now. Even though they've invested in their infrastructure, they're doing all the right things, they've become more competitive, they're having a tough time. Some of you may know about them because actually, just a couple years ago, President Obama was in that factory in Youngstown using it as a backdrop to tout our American manufacturing comeback. But a record level of import penetration is now causing incredible disruption for their production. These imports are entering our country at very low prices, and we all suspect this is the basis for a future trade remedy case. Again, either dumping, selling below cost, or subsidized product. They want to be sure that they have the ability to bring this case before it's too late. Our trade remedy laws just haven't kept up, again, with the fast pace of the global economy. Valorec had 1,200 workers in Youngstown just a couple years ago. They've now had to furlough 300 workers, and I'm told they're at about 20% capacity. Last week when I was on the floor, I talked about another company, Wheatland Tube, also in the Mahoning Valley. I've now got an email from one of the officials at uh, Wheatland Tube, and this is what he said. 
As an individual employed in manufacturing, I understand better than most that trade is a key component for economic growth. So he starts off saying, we know we need to trade. Then he says, however, it's important for U.S. manufacturers, including steel and pipe producers, steel pipe and tube producers, to have the tools to challenge unfair trade. And that's why I believe that any and all future trade agreements considered must include enforcement provisions to ensure that trade is conducted fairly. As a U.S. citizen who makes a living in manufacturing, provisions included in the Leveling the Playing Field Act, that's the amendment I'm talking about, will close loopholes in the trade laws to ensure that companies can access those laws to challenge trade distorting practices. I also support language in the TPP that prevents currency manipulation and the dumping of foreign products in the United States, he says. It's essential that provisions to close loopholes in trade laws are included in the final trade bill. After all, there's a huge difference between fair trade and free trade. JMC Steel Group, which is the parent group of his organization, relies on these laws and has utilized them in recent years to challenge trade distorting practices that injure our industry and our employees. Without laws to regulate unfair trade, I know my job. My job, he says, and the jobs of thousands of other manufacturing workers are at risk. So to uh, Mike Mack, who sent me this email from Wheatland Tube in Warren, Ohio, I appreciate your expressing your point of view. And I appreciate your supporting this amendment. And I appreciate the fact that you understand that trade's important and that you have to be competitive. And that's not easy. It requires some concessions. It requires some sacrifices. But once you do that, we've got to be sure that we've got their back. When these American pipe and tube manufacturers in my office yesterday they said one thing that really worried me. They said, if our trade remedy laws aren't fixed and fixed quickly, one of us will not be at this table next year because we'll be out of business. These were good companies. These were companies doing the right thing. And they're telling me, look around the table, there's a, several of us here now, at least one of us may not be here next year. Because of the concerns that we're hearing from workers, from companies, again, we're offering a very simple, modest, and reasonable clarification of U.S. law regarding the definition of material injury. In fact, I believe it's actually exactly what Congress intended originally. The proposed legislation makes no substantive changes to the definition of material injury. Instead, the legislation clarifies that the International Trade Commission shall not determine that there is no material injury or threat of material injury to a domestic industry merely because the domestic industry is still making money or because the performance of the domestic industry is improved. This clarification, I think, underscores what the current language already shows. The definition of material injury is not intended to be so burdensome on U.S. companies that they have to go under or at least see job loss before they can get the relief that they deserve. So I hope this amendment will be supported as it was in the customs package. I hope we can get it to the floor for a vote. I think it's incredibly important that we make sure that this goes along with something that's also very important, which is the ability to expand our exports all around the world. We want to be sure that American companies who are being harmed by illegal imports feel that we're here to back them up and know they won't have to wait and watch as subsidized or dumped imports put them on the verge of going out of business and laying off hundreds, if not thousands, of workers. So the whole notion here is that before companies are gravely or severely injured, they have the chance to make their case so they can have confidence in the U.S. trade laws that they'll be enforced as Congress originally intended they be and be able to compete on this level playing field. Protecting workers and jobs is not a partisan issue, by the way. This is something both sides of the aisle believe in. It's about fairness. It's about ensuring that those factory workers in towns all across America understand that as we expand exports, as we open up trade between countries, we're also looking out for them to ensure that it's done in a fair way. That if they are willing to work hard, play by the rules, they can indeed not just succeed but thrive here in this, the greatest country on the face of the earth, the country that has this economy that has been in the past the envy of the entire world on the cutting edge. We need to get back to that. We need to continue making things in this country. We need to continue encouraging innovation and creativity. And in doing so, we will be able to have the kind of robust economic recovery that all of us hope for. 
Part of this is trade, more exports, being sure it's fair. Part of this is ensuring that in this body, we provide those rules of the road. If we do so, I believe we'll not only be able to help the people we represent, as we should, but also begin to rebuild a consensus around the importance of trade. Some of you probably followed what's going on in the House this week with regard to Trade Promotion Authority. It's tough to find the votes. And I think that's reflective of the fact that a lot of our constituents back home are skeptical. They're skeptical about trade because they've seen too often that, as I mentioned earlier, other countries are not playing by the rules. And I gave you the specific examples of the U.S. Steel Company trying to sell its product into China or the EU being blocked but yet not being able to get relief here. We can fix this. It's not a matter of changing our posture on trade. We're a country that is courageous. We believe in trade. We're not going to shrink from it. But we're also a country that believes in rules and believes in taking care of the people who we represent so that they're not unfairly treated in the international marketplace. That's what this debate's about. I hope we'll have a good vote on the currency manipulation amendment we talked about. Whether we are able to get the other amendment up or not is still a matter of, of debate, as I understand it. I hope we'll be able to work through that and be able to offer this incredibly important amendment that's bipartisan called Level the Playing Field I talked about. Having votes on both of those, I think, strengthens trade promotion authority. It frankly, makes it easier to get that legislation through the House and to, in the end, be able to get America back in the business of helping the workers, the farmers, the service providers who we represent. I yield back my time.